Hey everybody, it's Robot here from Vespa Motorsport and ScooterWest.com here in San Diego, California. For all things Vespa, check us out on the web, ScooterWest.com. So if you haven't watched the intro to this scooter, it's an all original P200E from 1978 with 3,000 miles. The problem being is it hasn't been used for a while and it has original oil seals, gaskets, clutch plates in the motor. It doesn't matter how low the miles are, those are typically items that would need to be replaced in an engine. So today I'm gonna do the basic overhaul of a vintage Vespa P200E motor. The same steps all apply to any of the P-range motors and even mostly into the scooters from the 60s and 70s as well. So if you have a PX150, that's a 2011, pretty much all the same steps. They haven't changed these motors all that much, but I'm gonna go over all the steps to do a basic engine overhaul with the motor inside the frame. If you're looking to do a more in-depth overhaul or a full restoration, you may check out our videos, the full multi-part series on a restoration of a P200 and we we have all the steps on how to rebuild a motor. I think it was a, a PX125 uh, or P125X motor. We put a cylinder kit on it. You'll see a link to the video um, that you can click if you wanna see the longer, more in-depth uh, rebuild video. But today, I'm just gonna do the basic rebuild on this motor and it's gonna go much quicker. So there's a couple basic parts you'd always change out if you're doing a rebuild on a vintage Vespa. Uh, you wanna do the whole entire gasket kit I tend to like the original Piaggio gasket kits. We have these always in stock. They're affordable, they're good quality, pretty much the original gaskets. There's higher end gaskets that have treated paper and there's cheaper gasket kits out there as well. So you wanna have a gasket kit that includes the O-rings. Um, you're gonna need the clutch cover O-ring, which for some reason is never included in the gasket kits. Zero, one, 7781 or I don't know, I'll have the, the part numbers in the description as well. Um, you're gonna need the, the castle nut for the clutch since that usually you bend one of those tabs, it's kind of trash at that point. Uh, recommend changing this uh, lock washer that's underneath the flywheel nut, 012555 I think is the part number. You're gonna need a cotter pin for the rear um, drum, 012798. A, I think is our part number. And very important, and mainly why I'm going in this motor is replacing these dried out, all original 40 year old seals in there. So I'm gonna replace both the crankshaft seals. This one's easy to change, it's behind the flywheel in stator. This one, you need to pull the clutch and then the crankshaft out of the way to change this seal. Uh, this is the upgraded seal that's used on the newer Vespas. Uh, we have a complete set. If you just search seal set on our website, scooterwest.com, there's a discount when you buy the whole set of seals. Uh, rear hub seal, the PX uh, series have an internal seal with a felt seal on the um, dust seal on the rear bearings. They're a little different, but the early P200Es, they typically use this set of seals with a 27 millimeter um, hub. Sometimes if the rear hub's been replaced, you may need a 30 millimeter hub seal. Uh, anytime you take apart old clutch, typically the cork plates have all deteriorated. I recommend like a high quality brand such as Surflex or New Friend. Clutch PL200 is the whole set of uh, cork plates for the clutch. Probably won't need the steel plates since the scooter has so low miles unless their plates are just completely stuck. And regardless of the miles, anytime I go inside a motor, I'll replace the shifting cross. And I tend to like the original Vespa shifting cross 130. 939-PA. And this is pretty much from the 70s all the way up till 1982. Well, 1983, they went to a new, newer style transmission referred to as the EFL transmission. It uses a different shifting cross and it's shimmed differently. But with this motor being so low miles, these are the only parts I anticipate replacing in it. Moving on to the tools. You're just gonna need a basic set of tools. You know, adjustable wrench, different flat bladed Phillips screwdrivers, a set of combination wrenches. I have a seven millimeter, eight millimeter, 11, a 13 and a 17 would be typically what's needed uh, for vintage Vespa. For the sockets, the common sizes used, used, I like a quarter inch drive, 11 and a 13. 
but for the larger size, I'd do a 3 8 drive for a 17 and a 19, dismantle the flywheel and clutch. Um, I'm going to use a power ratchet, not really needed. A large screwdriver is sometimes useful. And moving on to the specialty tools, this is the original set of tools to you know, pretty much pull the crankshaft into the main bearing. I'm going to try to show you how to do it without this tool because this tool is rather expensive and it can be done without this tool with just a clutch and I'll show how to do that. But some of the tools you definitely will need in order to successfully rebuild one of these motors, you'll need the tool to remove the clutch nut. If you're dealing with a much later PX um, with the Koza style clutch, it's not going to use that. You're going to need a flywheel puller and this is a clutch compressor. And we have all these tools available at all times, always ready to go. So um, to get the muffler off, usually you'll need a hammer, a punch, chisel. I got a couple more wrenches. But I anticipate these are the only tools I'll need to do this complete overhaul, minus an oil pan, the drain, whatever gearbox oil that's remaining in this engine. So the first thing you want to do is have an extremely clean engine. And you can accomplish this with a pressure washer, um, you know, just some type of degreaser, clean the whole motor with the big nylon bristle brush, clean it. Fortunately, this motor is really clean because it's just low miles. It does have oil leakages, but there's not much grime and dirt. The last thing you want to do with a engine rebuild where it's in, in the frame is have dirt from other parts of the scooter fall into the motor or when you're splitting the engine cases. So just take the extra time. It doesn't take much time to clean it. Uh, clean or drain the, uh, the, the gearbox oil, it's 11 millimeters. And I just use a combination wrench. So definitely not much oil, it should hold a little bit more than that, but it's probably just oozed out of the engine over the years. Uh, we're gonna take the tins off the scooter, uh, dismantle the carburetor, pull the flywheel and cylinder. So all pretty simple steps to do. It's got four screws on the outside and I have a magnetic tray, so I'll keep, keep all this hardware. This has got a grounding uh, screw for the, the ignition and that little clip that holds the neutral wire if you still have that. And if you move on to these lower two screws, they're gonna be a little bit longer. So pull these out and you'll see that they're a little bit longer screw with typically they'll have a split washer. The scooter's nice and original and has all the original stuff. So. And down here, this should be another longer screw. And oftentimes we'll have a flat washer. And the last one's a short screw at the top here. And I'd recommend using a big enough flat blade screwdriver so you don't chew up these original cheese head style screws. So. And if it's a 200 engine, they always have a single Phillips screw here with a crazy little wave washer. Now I can pull fan cover and the selector box. And if you're having difficulty with the selector box, you can just get a flat blade screwdriver and pry it away. Tell us the original grease under there from 1978. Pull these two parts off. That's a telltale that the crankshaft seals have been leaking for you know, quite a long time. So whatever oil is leaking through the crankshaft seal, you can clean that in a parts washer. If you still have it, there's an original cap for the, the center nut. It's pretty nice to have. I mean, left behind a little plastic. There's still available as a replacement part, but most of the time people just don't bother with that. It keeps the threads inside your flywheel from rusting, and that's, that's why it's uh, good to have. We'll pull the spark plug cap off. I'm undecided if I'll keep that spark plug cap, but we'll visit that when we go over the ignition system in another video. On the front, right, right beside the spark plug cap, there's a very large flat screw, typically. Sometimes it's Phillips if it's on a later motor, like a PX. It'd be a, a big number three or number four Phillips, but that's what it looks like. Or it's been replaced with a regular nut, I've seen, but the flat screw is originally what these had in the 70s. And now the, the plastic shroud can just be pulled right off. Reveal the cylinder. 
Now we'll move on to dismantle the electrical. You could take the motor apart and leave all this connected, but um, in a later video, I'm probably going to overhaul all the electronic ignition system, so that will be another part. So there's a single Phillips screw that removes the junction box cap. Pull the grommets off, they're still in great condition. I'm gonna reuse those. And I'll show you this original wiring. So this is the original green wiring that usually is deteriorating. You can see it's cracked. That's what's happening with this wire. You do not wanna leave this green wire that's um, cracked. If you have a later P200, you wanna make sure the battery is disconnected because there is power that goes through these wires. Uh, not a problem on this, but I'm gonna disconnect all the wires. Um, one thing is that was purple, but you can see the color has faded quite a bit. The two yellows don't matter. That's your charging circuit right there. And moving on to underneath the, this boot, see how the wire's all crumbling? I can go ahead and disconnect all these wires as well. So, And all the wires, I'll show you what they look like when we get the stator plate out. Definitely not usable. It may work for a while, but it's probably gonna strand you. So. So you can see the deterioration of these wires and we'll cover in another video on how to rebuild, replace those, that green ignition kill wire. If you still have the neutral switch, which is a pretty rare part, you can see this boot is just completely disintegrating, but it's a pretty rare part. I'm just gonna carefully pull this molten grease off. I'll probably still reuse the boot, even though it is kind of turned into molten rubber. Um, it still is probably useful. It's got a pair of um, spade connectors. They just pull right off. I'm sure all this still works. Uh, oftentimes this stuff has been knocked off on the scooter and it's not, um, no longer works or doesn't function. Not a deal breaker, but it's definitely nice to have. So now the wiring's disconnected. Put it out of the way so you keep it out. Um, you could pull this junction box off just to show you how that, that comes off with the wiring, how that's all disconnected. Next, we'll get the air box out of the way. And again, it will be another video on overhauling the whole fuel system on the scooter, clean the carburetor, probably reuse the original carburetor. So there's a pair of flat, these kind of weird looking hex screws that have flat, um, flats in there. And one thing is, be careful, I see a lot of times where there's all these scratches right here in the frame because a technician's rubbing his screwdriver right against the frame. So, you know, if I'm doing a restoration, I don't want to be scratching brand new paint, even if it's um, underneath there, but just be conscious. I see oftentimes that's all scratched up or I'd protect all this area. So there's a pair of screws that hold the, uh, the air box cover on and we'll see how good the gasket is. It may be still usable, but. I just gave it a little pry and it will just pull right up. And the gasket's a little hard, but there's the inside the air box. You can use that as a, a tray to hold the screws. Um, probably replace all that. And to continue taking apart the, to get the air box off and the carburetor out, there's a pair of screws that hold this mesh air filter. You don't replace these filters, typically just clean them. As long as these vintage Vespas have a nice air bell, they're gonna get nice, clean, cool air from underneath the seat and through the frame, which is quite an ingenious uh, design. You know, it's like, they don't pull the dusty air from around the rear tire, they pull it from the frame as long as you have a good air bell in there, so. Get that out of the way, I'll just leave the screws. You can see all the varnish from the um, old fuel. It's kind of built up on there. Um, Somebody has put a new fuel line in this at one point, but it's, I can tell it's as hard as a rock. So let me lower the lift so we can see this a little bit better. And I'll show you what I'm gonna take apart. So um, sometimes you can get in there with a flat blade screwdriver. That one's pretty loose, but sometimes you may need to just put 11 millimeter. Um, even though the fuel tap states it's on, it doesn't flow, everything's so gummed up. I uh, don't really care about these gaskets. Yeah, the fuel line's actually in okay shape, but I'm not, not gonna um, reuse that. So, 
get the banjo out of here. This is the easiest way. I always like taking the banjo off. You know, and if you're having difficulty, I know my hand's kind of in the way. This is not the original hose clamp, but it's, it works. You can use these worm gear clamps. And I'll probably reuse that. It's still in good shape, but definitely not the fuel line. So, so say, say you can't get that off easily. Just take a knife and just slice the hose, even if it's like a rock. Just take a little, if you just slice the hose, it will relieve the hose. So then the, this banjo will come right off. Anytime you take this apart, I just change the hose. The, the ethanol in the fuel just kind of deteriorates these hoses and um, just from the age. So get those two parts out of the way. And one more thing to disconnect from the carburetor. This is your choke cable right there. So I'm press, pressing it with the, um, with the flat blade screwdriver. Now I'm able to pull the choke cable out of there. And we'll take a small extension with 11 millimeter socket and take the carburetor out. On the much later ones, they use, I think, a 10 millimeter Allen. Ooh, those things are loose. You know, this thing has 3,000 miles. That's something you typically do with a, on a service on these Vespas. Go in there, uh, make sure your carburetor's not leaking, make sure it's tight. That's uh, something I always check when I do a service on one of these kind of uh, scooters. So, loosen both of those up. And take extra care when you lift this up. You do not want to have those, the parts drop into the engine because at this point we're exposing the top of the engine. And I'll show you how those are set. They have a split washer and a flat washer. I'm going to just leave it all there, so both of those. That's for a later video. We're going to overhaul this carburetor. And next we'll go ahead and disconnect the, the throttle cable. So you could get a cable and just pop it out. You can see the little barrel on there. And now we're able to pull the cable out. So both the throttle and the choke cable have been disconnected. And I'll show you a trick that I do with this, these oil lines. So it doesn't have a clip anymore, which is probably something you give it a couple of rotates. And when you pull these lines off, it's best if you push them off and not just pull them off. And there may be still oil in there. I've always just grabbed one of the five millimeter screws, the one for the junction box or the carburetor lid, and you can just plug the, the oil line just to keep it from dripping. Uh, the air bellow, you know, my technician, I don't know, I, don't th I think that might be an original one. I thought you put a new thing, but that's completely rotted, so we'll probably put a new one in there. For some reason, I thought you put a new air bellow in, but that's not the case. Um, so that's something we'll replace when we reassemble the motor. Um, to get this air box off, you want to lift the gasket, pull that out of the way, and it's going to reveal a single screw underneath here. So to go ahead and pull that screw out of the way. The reason you need to get the air box out of the way is the motor doesn't really drop down too easily when it's um, when it's uh, still attached to the air box that is, is attached to the thing. So give it a couple little, little wiggles and it will just pry right off. And you can see the fuel line will pull right through. The grommet's still in really good shape. That screw, just remember that's there. Uh, this would be a perfect time to put a little rag or something over the, um, the intake of the carburetor or the, the engine. Yeah, I'm gonna pull this gasket off, that's not needed anymore. Put a new one in there, but just to protect things. Um, another, another way to do it, I think I might have shown it in a previous video, is um, you can make your own little, you can trace the gasket that goes over there and just cut it out of some cardboard and push it over those two studs and that will prevent um, anything from dropping down. So pretty much everything besides the clutch, the shift, and the rear brake cables are, um, they're all disconnected. But that's all we need to disconnect to, to pull the motor. Um, I'm gonna show you how I leave the, the shift cables all intact. We're gonna wanna um, lift the rear tire off the, the ground. I have the front tire clamped in a nice uh, 
workshop lift, but you could improvise with wood blocks or a bunch of other ways to kind of um, get the, you know, suspend the motor more or the less. So you see the whole tire spins right there. And I'm going to go ahead and remove the selector box. Still dripping a tiny bit. So 11 millimeter socket, go between the two here. And then maybe nylocks or just regular nuts. Either one works fine. So get those out. And I'll reuse the hardware. Oftentimes, if I'm doing a fresh rebuild on a, a restoration, I'd replace all the hardware. Pretty inexpensive. And it just looks nice having brand new hardware. But this hardware is still pretty shiny. Believe it or not, the oil film on it kind of protects it and keeps the hardware from rusting. But all the hardware is really nice looking on there. And I could give it a quick little cleaning in the parts washer as well. So, so if they have a regular nut, they're just going to have uh, both a split washer and a flat washer. This one had the nylon locking nuts, so there's only a flat washer. Uh, you can get those out of the way, um, or you can let them fly off when you uh, remove the selector box. But just kind of keep all your hardware. At this point, you can see it's already wanting to come off. So you get a little bit of oil in there. So, and the cable is clamped right in front of this header here. So kind of dirty up in there, but you could get a flat bladed screwdriver and pry that thing open. That clamp's reusable and just kind of disengage this whole, this whole setup out of there. So at this point you see the whole thing wants to come out, but the easy way about this is to just go up here and shift towards first and wiggle the selector box as you're doing that. So yeah, kind of once you wiggle everything, it just pops the box right off. So this thing is in great shape considering it's only got 3,000 miles. Everything's really tight in it. I have no reason to believe there's any problem with this. I'll just put fresh grease in there and we'll grease the cables when we uh, reassemble it and we'll have a new gasket. That's all I'm going to do with this. This thing's in perfect shape. Nothing wrong with that. So, uh, the spindle's tight. No, no issue there. There's a gasket that we'll probably have to scrape off. No, looks like it will come right off. So, you know, all these gaskets are crispy and old. So they're all trash at this point. I wanted to do a rebuild video on a small frame, but we sold the small frame. If somebody wanted a, a project, the last small frame I had in here that was for sale. And I never have time when it's a customer bike because we've got to get it turned around. Um, next, I'm going to go ahead and pull the flywheel off. Um, if you watch my ignition timing and ignition troubleshooting video, you can lock up the flywheel carefully with kind of an old screwdriver that you don't mind marring up the plastic. You can wedge that between the, the selector box. But the easy way to go about it, if you just want to zip it off, just get an impact. And I figure if you're doing, if you have a, a well-equipped equipped, uh, workshop, you're gonna have air tools or an electric impact like this. So 19 millimeter socket on there. And you know, it doesn't take much effort to to spin that off. And then next I'll put the flywheel puller on. Um, one thing, if you're going to use an impact on a flywheel puller, you got to make sure this thing's all the way threaded in because the worst thing is you impact this flywheel puller and what happens is it ends up ripping the threads right out of the flywheel. Then you're kind of SOL and just be very, very careful with it. So, you know, just only enough to kind of So you don't want to go to town because you can break the flywheel puller or rip the threads out if you're using an impact to do that. But definitely makes the job a little easier. And the stator looks great, but I know the wiring isn't. So pull the, the puller out. This little guy on this is going to replace it. Typically, you don't want the flywheel coming off. Um, and check the magnets on this flywheel. I'm sure it's in great shape because it hasn't been monkeying with. They're so strong. I mean, it holds this wrench like 
in 17 or 19 millimeter wrench. It's nice and tight. So no, no problems there. Don't need to re-magnetize this. Uh, it's perfect condition in there. There's no problems. Um, the Woodruff key is staying in place, so I'll just leave that in there. I'll show you that a little bit later down the road. Um, get the flywheel out of the way. Typically with a P200, you just have those two marks lined up. That's 23 degrees for a P200. Um, or sometimes they'll have the A and IT mark. Um, so and I'll just kind of show you also so you got the screws, it's got a wave washer, a flat washer. Sometimes these are really tight and you may need to um, tap them with a hammer or use an impact screwdriver to get those screws out. If you damage the screws, you want to replace them. And just showing you, you can see this thing has never moved. It's always been in that one spot. No one's ever set the timing. And see how that one's being a little difficult? you can use an impact screwdriver to remove the screw. And I'd probably just replace that screw now that it's got a little bit of damage to it. Got a metal ended screwdriver. I'll give this a try and see if I can. And once you give it a couple taps, sometimes that's enough to, to break it loose. So you put pressure on it and you can go on there with a wrench and there you go. It didn't take much at all. Just the act of tapping on a screw sometimes is enough, but when I reassemble the scooter, I'll probably replace just this one screw. So just to kind of show you the timing. So that's about, right there is about 23 degrees. And you know, it's before top dead center. So if you wanted less, less, less timing, you can go all the way to, um, that's about 18 degrees if you were right there. And that's where it's at the end of the screw. If you're beyond that, there's not really a need to, but I think it's like 35 degrees. There's not really any need to ever have the timing there. But if you're on a 125 or 150, typically the plate's closer to that mark. Uh, a 200 is about 23 degrees around there. And on stock motors, it's not all that critical. You know, it will run um, plus minus three or four degrees, no problem. So you pull the wires through, it's a nice original stator. Actually, these wires, these are almost the best I've ever seen, but they're not very usable when they're all crispy up here, starting to fall apart. So it's something we'll definitely rebuild. Uh, this is a service we offer. I've rebuilt hundreds of these stator plates, just they come in all the time. Um, the fortunate thing is I have really nice wiring here at the shop. Um, we'll make these things look brand new and we can do it, you know, my lead techs would both know how to solder really good. And I'm an electronic nerd, so I like to solder stuff too. So every once in a while I'll get my hands dirty. Uh, next video, but I'll show how to rebuild that. And typically I like to store the stator right in the flywheel. Keep your fingers out so you don't get pinched, but it just pulls right in. So get the cylinder out of the way. So from the other side, I'm not going to move the camera over to the other side, but um, you want to loosen the single nut that holds the muffler on. It's, it's right in the center of the motor, and the best thing to do that is a ratchety uh, 17 millimeter wrench. I'm just going to loosen it for right now, not take the muffler all the way off yet. All right, so there's a th single 13 millimeter right there. You could go ahead and just loosen that until it kind of frees up. And it's just a clamp that goes onto a steel uh, spigot. Or if you're on the smaller engines, like the 125, 150, uh, PX, they're going to just have a, the whole cylinder is cast iron along with the spigot. So that thing's loose right now. Uh, the w easiest way to get this off, you know, it's going to be usually stuck on there with carbon, is take a chisel and you see that weld right there? So right below the Kickstarter, I'm going to get the chisel on that weld, kind of hold it at a 45 degree angle. And just give it a couple. And now the, the header pipe has dropped off it. You know, I had the other bolt already loose. I'll, at a later step, I could remove the muffler. Probably no need to really remove it. it can just stay right there. Um, you could technically leave the cylinder on and just pull the two studs out and pull the case off. But 
I want to inspect it pretty far and I want to pull the crankshaft out. So we'll take the whole entire cylinder off. Uh, there's a single uh, standoff on the upper left uh, stud. There's four studs on the, uh, that hold the cylinder. Not really showing, but you're going to have that pull right out. So to get a spark plug socket, you use this 13 16 uh, spark plug socket to get the spark plug out of the way. Uh, I already checked the compression of this motor before I started the job. Compression is really good, so I don't have any suspect that I'm going to need to re-ring it. I know sometimes they say rings get tired from age, but I suspect it's going to be in great condition on the top end, never had any moisture. Uh, Nippon Denso plug, I'll probably put an NGK in there, brand new one. So next we'll just go to all the head nuts and just crack them like at maybe an eighth of a turn. Just go between each of them and just, you don't want to just loosen one all the way because you may warp the head. So that one's getting loose. And back to that, getting pretty close. Now they're all loose, so no issues there. Not pulling the studs out of the engine. It's being a nice original engine's never been really messed with. And I'll just separate the socket from the the ratchet, so it's a little easier. And you use nicer quality extensions. They kind of have knurled um, end on, so you could spin them really easily with your fingers. Could use a power tool of some sort to do this, but. Typically, taking off a cylinder head, you want to do it with hand tools. So this one's being a little stubborn. Give it a couple more turns with a ratchet. Just a little bit of rust on the threads of the, the stud. Sometimes can't quite do it by hand. And there we go. So you got the four nuts that hold the, uh, the head on. Uh, there's still lock washers and flat washers that are behind and typically I'll just carefully pull this off and and you'll be just fine so so the head will just clear the uh, all the studs just barely you know you can see it's right up against the pipes and cables but there's just enough room to get it out of there on the 200s 125 is a little easier you take all those washers, you could just dump them right out into the magnetic tray. That thing is beautiful looking. It's never leaked or anything. I mean, that's very little carbon. It's definitely a 3,000 mile bike. Uh, doesn't even need much cleaning up. Um, could spray it with some type of like carburetor cleaner, you know, just to break it up. You'll see it will kind of eat that up. Wipe it with um, or scrub it. You know, it will clean right up and it doesn't, you know, you don't need to clean it till it's polished metal. You just get the build up on there. You can see it's already, that thing's in great condition. Doesn't need much more work. You see, they say USA, I think they change the profile and the compression is different for the US model P200. So we're going to go ahead and remove the studs. I'll start with these outer two studs. And the, the way to do it without a stud remover tool, I mean, in the shop workshop, I do have a tool that will remove the studs. Go ahead and thread a nut on there. And typically I just replace these nuts anyway, so, you know, they're a little bit sacrificial that I'm using them as a tool. And then thread a second nut on there, so pretty, and then after that, you back the first knot that you installed, and then you tighten the um, second one. And you just give it a little, you tighten them against each other. And at that point, you could pull the stud out usually. So, And if it just slips a little bit, you're going to just need to tighten this whole setup a little bit more. And there we go. I think we're, we have, you know, once it breaks free, it's not pretty easy to do so. And you could just leave those uh, nuts right on 
on the um, the studs because when you reinstall them, that you use the same setup, and then just remove the pair of nuts before you put the head back on. And just to show you on the studs, see how it has a short end and a longer end? The short end on the 200 eight millimeter studs goes into the engine case, the longer end. And you make sure they're all about, you know, set about the same amount of depth when you reinstall them. So at this point, you could just pull the cylinder up without the outer studs. You could pull this case off. But like I said, I'm gonna take the motor a little further apart. So let's just get all the studs out of here so I could pull the whole cylinder. I have the last two with a double nuts and I broke them free. And I'll cheat with a, the electric ratchet right here. And at this point, you push the piston all the way down and you can pull the cylinder right off, no problem. So it pulls right off and clears. Look at that piston and this looks beautiful. Only a couple little scores that but still see all the original cross hatching. It's a gorgeous condition. So first of all, I'll go ahead and loosen all the case nuts and I usually start with the inner ones. Just break them all free, you know, not as critical as the cylinder head. And I'm just kind of going back and forth between the nuts. So we got six of them, seven. You see the piston kind of want to rock out right when I did that. This one's got the clip for the thing. There's our eighth. Um, go to nine, 10, and 11. And there's one more. Uh, I've seen people attempt to take these motors apart and they forget there's one that's going the other direction. I'm just gonna use a combination wrench, get it back there and loosen that. So now that they're all loose, I'm gonna start with this one and just get, get it all the way out. And it's easiest just to do it with a combo wrench or you could get a ratchet back there as well, but let's get it out of the way. You can already tell it's pretty, Getting pretty close. So the nice thing about the P200 and P125, uh, well, with the exception of the electric start one, but they pretty much use almost all the same size studs. There's only one stud that's a little longer. Studs come out, they got a flat washer, a split washer, which you typically would replace, and the nut. And this is the only one that faces the the opposite direction. You see it's been leaking oil on it for quite a long time. I can clean all these parts, but it's, I think about the oil on it, it's like perfectly preserved. The nice black oxide coating's not rusted at all. I'll tell you a little thing. When I first was rebuilding Vespas and I was too cheap to buy the hardware, I'd reuse the hardware that was underneath the stator plate. It looked a lot nicer and I would put it on the back side of the motor. So you see the nicer hardware. And then I'd put the ugly hardware underneath here. Um, nowadays I have a whole shop in my control room, so um, I typically put new hardware, oh, with the exception of this bike, which I'll just um, reuse all these beautiful looking original hardware. So at this point, got all the nuts off. Uh, this little tab thing will come right off. And it's got like a little split washer that holds, you know, lock, locks the thing in place. Um, just get all the washer. A couple of them fell on the ground. I, it hit me as I was taking the bike apart or taking the motor apart. Um, and not that critical. If you leave some of those washers behind, you could grab them with a magnet or just pull the case apart and they just fall, fall on the ground and you can go retrieve them later. So, you know, however you want to get, get them all off. It's These are pretty handy uh, needle nose. They just have a curve to them and they happen to work in a lot of different applications where, and they're even slightly magnetized, which probably weren't originally magnetized. So all the washers are out of the way. They're not gonna fall all over the place or in the engine. Have them all on my magnetic tray. So 
Uh, next step is we're going to get the engine case apart. I still left the Kickstarter in place. And before I take it off, I'll, I'll, we're going to take the Kickstarter apart because there's a gasket or an O-ring seal under there. That's going to loosen that. But I'm going to leave it on there for right now. So, because the Kickstarter helps you when you're taking the motor apart. So, so at this point, you could probably sometimes wiggle the case apart. You can see how it's separating. Uh, you could carefully take a hammer, like a mechanics hammer, give it little taps. You can also tap on the the um, the Kickstarter to kind of separate. It's going to want to drip drip some oil out. Uh, there's a little tab right here that you can use a brass drip to to uh, kind of tap the case apart because oftentimes this pin will rust in place. And if that's the case, you want to take a small punch and dry that pin all the way through the motor and then put it back in place. But this motor is so original and there's no rust on it. It's not a problem here. So you see the engine case has been separated. No big deal. So at this point, it may drop a part or two. Separate that out. You have the gasket that's kind of tearing. Oh, this thing is beautiful inside. It has even old Italian uh, smell. I don't know, I just made that up, but whatever. Um, so you can see it's just super clean in this thing. But this is the kickstart gear. That's just dropped off that. Gonna get the gasket out of here. I don't see any rust on the crankshaft webs. This thing has definitely never had any problem with getting moisture in the engine. Something that you sometimes have problems. Eh, there's a little bit of surface rust. I'll, I'll take that back. Just a real small amount, but I don't think it's an issue. The bearing surfaces look look to be in great shape. Um, no problems there. So. so at this point, we have the right hand crank crankcase separated. And we could, you know, clean all these parts out. Sometimes I got gunk in here and just from the oil settling and there are no chunks. Nothing's ever spun around in the case. Um, these are even in great shape these rubber things, but I'll probably sw switch them around. I'll show you how I do that before I put it back together. So for the most part, I know mechanically this motor is going to be in very good, good condition con considering the mileage. The Kickstarter gear, I don't see any uh, serious wear on the teeth of these. Um, this thing, I want to reuse this original Kickstarter gear. We're going to take the gear shim apart, and you see how the wheel up, up off the ground. There is a little bit of play in here, and that's normal. Uh, there's a specification for this. I don't think it will, eh, maybe I could go up one size in shims. This shim right here is available in four different sizes. Um, typically as a motor and the gears wear, you need to change out the shim whenever you're in here changing a shifting cross. But um, We'll go ahead and use a large set of surf clip pliers. Be careful because this thing's under uh, some tension. And I kind of just Use a good set of uh, circle pliers, pull that off. And now we'll go ahead and separate the gear. So you got the shim, I could tell, just looking at that, it's probably the two millimeter original standard oversized shim. Inspect the gear teeth, or where the um, shifting cross engages with the gears, see if there's any wear. And just to show you how these all come apart. So you could kind of rotate them, get them past that that cruciform, and I'm stacking them in the order I've taken them off because I know this thing's all put together correctly. There's ways to, you could accidentally assemble it in the wrong order, especially on these older gearboxes. A uh, little bit oils and residue in the bottom, that's pretty normal. Um, this cruciform is in great condition, but probably gonna replace it, and I'll show how to change that out right now before we go any further. So you could put a large screwdriver into the um, into the gears right there, or into the, the slot where the cruciform slides. And this is gonna be reverse thread. So I'm gonna take a 13 millimeter wrench. This has never been off, so it's gonna be rather tight and have a lot of friction as we remove this. So the way they do this from when they're brand new is they swage the end of where it threads into the shifting cross. Unfortunately, you can't do that, but with the aid of modern things like Loctite, that's what will hold that in place. So you can see it's 
I'm turning it clockwise to loosen. And that's pretty much the only thing on these motors that they um, have reverse threads on here. So go ahead and separate that out. This little washer will typically drop right out. And you can see there's a round end of the cross and then a square end. So we're going to take the round end, tip it, pull that right out. Not much wear. That's a nice cross. I mean, it still had lots of life in it, but um, we're just going to replace that. So. so get the spare tire out of the way and I'll just do it nice and quickly with uh, the impact. One thing to keep in mind is you can accidentally short the, the battery out if you're not careful when you're going in there to, um, to loosen this uh, nut that retains the spare tire on the positive uh, side of the, the battery terminal there. So let's get the tire out of the way. So that's an original sticker that they had on those, on these scooters. And next we'll pop the little center cap off. You just use a flat blade screwdriver, get in there and next there's a, a cotter pin right here and you don't want to ever really reuse these. So just bend that out of the way. And I'll show you one other trick. Say if you just can't get it out, like it's in there, and it's a smaller cotter pin, you could just, you could use a punch to try to get out, but if you're gonna use an impact, oftentimes the cotter pins are made out of really soft metal. So, so 22 millimeter socket, and it will just cut the cotter pin right off. You can see it just broke it all up into pieces and doesn't damage anything because that's a hardened shaft and your cotter pin is pretty soft. So um, there's going to be a large washer behind there that will fall right out. And I have the scooter lifted, lifted up a little bit. So it's pretty easy to, um, to, you know, pull the tire out. Otherwise you want to pull that rear bumper. So now that the tire's out of the way, we can completely remove the muffler. You can take a 17 millimeter socket or just a combination wrench, pull the single bolt that goes to the muffler and pull that out of the way. This thing looks great. It's the original muffler. So now we'll remove the lower shock bolt. You have a 13 millimeter on this end and a 14 on the right side. And once you break that free, you get the nut and the split washer out of the way. Keep in mind, these are a unique size or nine millimeter. Now I'll lift the engine case, pull the uh, shock bolt out. Now the motor lowers right out. I still have both the clutch cable and the rear brake cable connected. So at this point, we have very easy access to the clutch cover. Uh, there's three six millimeter bolts that have 10 millimeter heads on the clutch cover. And you could just go between each three of them and break them free. Then you could just go ahead and take them all the way off. So just like the studs, you're gonna have a flat washer and a split washer. So those are all in good shape. Reuse those. And typically, the easy way to get this clutch cover off, just pull the clutch and it pops right off. So just the pressure, the pressure pin kind of pulls it. I left the clutch cable still connected and now we can get this right, right off, no problem. So kind of wiggles right off. Uh, you had a clutch cover. We'll go ahead and disconnect the cable. You could probably rebuild it with it in there, but we'll come back to that. Um, and go ahead and get the clutch out of the way. So you see this uh, clip, it's a little large. You could do this with the motor tucked up into the, uh, the frame, but I want to make it easy so you can see what I'm videotaping here. I ain't videotaping, filming, whatever you want to call it. So there's the pressure plate, looks to be in great, great condition. You can see this little tab washer and that lower tab is uh, bent down. So um, I almost think somebody has been in this clutch at one point. I see one other tab bent. You take your Vespa Motorsport pocket screwdriver. It's a flat blade screwdriver. It's got a magnet on the end, which is pretty handy. 
if it happens to have the right size tip to pry the tab down on this clutch. Of course, the thing's spinning around, but now all the tabs are uh, out of the way. Um, you can either use one of the, the tangs to lock up the clutch, or you could cheat it with an impact. And just a 17 millimeter wrench with the clutch nut will hold the clutch. So go ahead and you can remove the nut. Make sure you keep a lot of pressure because once, once it slips, you can end up ruining uh, this nut pretty easily. So you get a, two flat bladed screwdrivers behind the clutch and just carefully and equally pry the uh, clutch away. And with the piston in this position, the Woodruff key or the slot facing towards the front, you end up with the Woodruff key up at the top. The reason being is sometimes these will be loose and they'll drop into the motor, something you don't really want. So uh, We can pull the oil pump gear off. And it pulls right over the Woodruff key. I'm not going to mess with the Woodruff key because it's still in place. This is your oil pump drive. Still looks to be uh, in perfect shape. No issues there. Well, then next we're going to take this nut. And if you can, you can thread this on backwards where it's a perfect surface to tap the clutch or tap the crankshaft out. So from one side, I'm holding the crankshaft to support it because I don't want it to end up on the ground. And just carefully tapping it square on that, that nut to um, get it out. And you can not support the crank at first to give it the first couple taps. See how it's almost through the bearing at this point? At this point, I want to support the, um, the clutch. And you want to hit it squarely. I think I'm hitting it. And that's how you could safely pop the clutch out and always make sure you thread something on the end or it is possible to hit it with a soft brass hammer and you'd be fine. Because say there's some small amount of pitting on this crankshaft, I don't think it's going to be an issue. But if you see a lot of rust or sometimes you'll see a water line on the crankshaft, that means at some point there is water in the crankcase. And I would suggest just replacing the crankshaft. It is possible to rebuild it and put a new um, main bearing in it, but not really unnecessary, so. So no issues with the bearings. Everything turns really, really smooth without any noise. I'm not gonna replace any bearings. They have no evidence of rust or heavy wear. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and pry all the seals out. And there are specific tools for prying seals out, but if you do it carefully, you could do it with a flat blade screwdriver. Just get between the seal and pry it right out. And this is definitely the 27 millimeter seal, so we have the correct seal to put back in place. Keep in mind, sometimes a 30 millimeter seal. Now we'll move on to the other side and pop both the crankshaft seals out. So next we'll go ahead and remove the flywheel side crank seal. And again, I'm just, you can just lever the seal right out. Sometimes they're a little stubborn when they've been in there for a while. So just kind of work around and it will eventually pry right out. And let me inspect the seal. It's not the worst I've seen. It probably would run okay, but you can see the lip. It usually has a real sharp lip in there. And typically old seals, they'll, when they're dry, they'll, they'll wear that sharp lip out really quickly and um, end up with a real flat lip and it, they don't work very well or seal up to the, the shaft. And the most difficult seal that's buried in the motor is your clutch side main seal. So. So now we'll get the, the hidden clutch main seal. This one's the hardest one to get to. Get a little bit smaller screwdriver and just get between the, the bearing inner race. You don't want to get between the ball track or anything, damage your bearing and just pop it right out. And yeah, the seal is not in the best condition, but go ahead and put new seals in there and we'll move on. So everything looks pretty clean in here. Use some clean rags. You can use solvent if you want. Um, it could be brake parts cleaner, carburetor cleaner, even gasoline. Um, get all that stuff. 
I suspect somebody has had this, this case apart at one point. I can tell it has this stuff I haven't seen before because I've had a lot of original engines I've rebuilt over the years, but I think this has been apart at one point. But going through the exercise, I want to make sure it's all good and ready to go for, you know, and has a good service life for, you know, another 10 years down the road before you need to go back in the motor and replace these seals. So the tricky part of these seals is you do need to have some type of uh, piece of metal that will drive it in squarely. Uh, this is an original factory tool. You can improvise with a very large socket or find um, some other type of metal. Uh, it's a little more difficult to do this job when the motor's suspended and hanging from the bodywork, but we'll get the, uh, the seal started, get it pretty close to square, hold that, and just give it a couple taps. And it's not quite perfectly square. You can see the lip on the top is, needs a little bit. And you just go around and you give it taps. These steel seals, they're definitely, in some ways they're more difficult to install. And in some ways I like them a lot better. So you gotta make sure this whole edge is perfectly flush with aluminum. See how that's still a little bit out? So take the, the drift and just. And then even the note is changed now that the seal is perfectly flush all the way around. So, so there's your seal that's in there now. Make sure the bearing still turns freely. No problem there. So the mostly rubber flywheel side seal is much easier to install. And that typically I just take some grease and just kind of smear the whole thing with grease. Make sure it's clean in there. Bearings look good. No need to change those out on this motor. And we'll go ahead. You just usually press them in. And And typically this can just be flush with the um, surface. Again, it's easier if you do have a drift like this. And, and alternately, you can just carefully tap it around with a hammer. So make sure it's perfectly square and flush. So with your hub seal, or the wheel seal for the rear axle, this one typically is the easiest one to install. You can just see I'm just pushing it in. And the trick to it is you don't want to have it all the way in. You want it where it's, I don't know, about three millimeters in, that should be good right there. And it looks pretty square all the way around. Just with a little bit of grease, that one just presses in all the time. Doesn't need much to uh, pull that seal in. While I'm on this side, I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect the clutch, clutch uh, bell. Uh, I do wanna rebuild this so it's not leaking oil out of the bottom. Uh, this clutch cable is still in great condition. Typically, anytime I touch a a clutch, uh, I would just replace the cable. Um, you're gonna need a seven millimeter and an eight millimeter to undo the, uh, the cable clamp. So just undo the cable clamp and then you should be able to just pull this right off. And there's the cable clamp still in good, good condition. So I'll go ahead and take the clutch apart and use a co clutch compressor to disassemble the clutch. And I can tell at one point there's been new plates put in this, this clutch. So go ahead and give it a couple twists. I don't think there's gonna be any need to replace the springs on this. I mean, sometimes they do get weak from age. Make sure the clip's in there. And then the easy way to just disassemble is to give it a good tap and it falls right apart. So this brass thrust washer is still in good shape and same with this uh, bushing right here. The brass thrust washer is right here, still in perfect shape. No issues there. Same with this. This looks to be in really nice shape. A little ding there, but I'm not too worried about that. Not going to affect the operation. Um, and you can put a little bit of oil on this. If, it, if this was really dirty and it had a polluted clutch, I would take all these parts, you know, disassemble it further and clean everything in the parts washer. But this thing is so clean. That thing, it has no free play on it or very little free play. It spins fine. I put a little bit of oil on it. But the clutch plates, you know, they've been in there. Those things are like the cork is turned into a rock. So it's not going to work. 
Those are Surflex plates, so I know somebody's put new plates in it at some point in the scooter's life. But at this point, uh, we're starting with fresh, uh, soft, brand new cork plates. So you take the new cork plates. Yeah, I can tell I could dig my nail into those just fine. Two different styles. There's these uh, two and then the outer plate. So you could soak these overnight in oil, but they don't need much oil at all. So this is a 30, 30 weight non-detergent oil or modal trans oils. What we tend to use is the kind of name brand, nicer oil. We sell bottles of that. So go ahead and just drop each one of the plates in. And a small amount of oil. Steel plates are, there's no evidence that I think they're warped or any problems with them. So uh, no issues there. I'll just put them back in. If they're all burnt and, and blued, then I would probably replace them. You know, just a little bit of oil, just to, to initially uh, lubricate the clutch. Kind of ironic, the clutch has friction, but it's lubricated by oil. So. But that's the way these clutches work with the, the wet, wet plate systems on these. So there's that, and then the last one, you can, so this is pretty much all the, the cork, cork plates have some amount of oil on it. So this one, sometimes it's a little hard to get in. You may need to, to work it a little bit all the way around. Pop the clip in. There's like, if you feel this clip, there's a sharper edge and a softer edge. The sharper edge should face out. So like I said, I don't see any need to really replace the springs. Then you want to make sure this clip is all the way in, all the way around. So looks pretty good. And carefully undo this. I'll have it about that loose where it's still loose. Give it a couple taps, make sure the clip is um, definitely in place. Looks good all the way around. Double check it because I've seen many times where that clip will pop out. So that's pretty much the quickie clutch rebuild. You know, in the full engine rebuild video I did, I tore this all the way down and explained every single part, but that's all I needed to do in this, is just replace those old cork plates, kind of crusty old cork plates. Next, we're gonna replace the remaining um, O-rings and gaskets in the engine. So, got this clutch bell, it's in pretty nice shape. You can clean it up even further with rags and solvent. Um, but I'll show you how these gaskets look and in what condition they are. So that's the O-ring. It's not even uh, round anymore. It's like triangle. It doesn't seal anymore. It's trash at this point. Uh, this brass uh, push pin, still in good shape. Go ahead and pull that out. No problems there. I'll put that back in when we're all done. And next, I want to disassemble the clutch a little further because there is an O-ring that seals this. And you can just get a flat blade screwdriver under here and pop the spring off and it will um, disengage. And then you can pull the shaft, shaft right out here. So uh, I can tell that O-ring's pretty crispy and old. Pulled out a little too easy. Let's clean these parts up. And you take this O-ring and you could just usually squeeze it and just take it right off, no problems there. And it comes in this nice folder here. This is the newer style Piaggio gaskets. They're treated gaskets, so they're much less likely to leak oil. Great quality. Um, the older all paper gaskets, typically you wanna put type, some type of grease or um, shellac on the gaskets to kind of seal them up but these ones are in pretty good shape so you want to take that smaller o-ring put a little bit of grease on it so the smaller o-ring that's included in the kit and then we'll just go ahead and with a little bit of grease on it slide it all the way down this uh, clutch shaft here so So there you go. Put a little bit more grease on the, the shaft. And I still have this little lever 
remaining in the um, in the um, the clutch there. <clears throat> Put that on there and just go ahead and get that in there. So and it engages right into that little lever. And the next part is we'll get this um, back engaged with uh, that little notch there that I derailed. So just take a needle nose or a, a real small screwdriver to do the same thing and just carefully wrap it around. And now you have that resealed. Dab of grease in there and go ahead and drop this back in the, the, the push pin and another dab of grease on it. So that's ready to reassemble short of the, the big O-ring that's not included with the, the, um, the whole gasket kit. For some reason, they never include this O-ring. So put the 17781 or 017781, I think is part number on this. And just go ahead and wrap that around. It's got some grease on it. It's perfect. So this thing's ready to go. Our clutch is ready to go. We'll set that out of the way and move on to the right side crank crankcase cover. So typically you would want to clean this up pretty good, like in a parts washer. Um, this thing doesn't take much at all to clean. I'm just wiping it with a rag and it's going to look perfect and probably could use a little degreaser when I get it back together. So, so you can see there's a lot of oil leaking from this area. That's because oftentimes they'll leak from the, um, the kickstart shaft. So take the pair of washers off. And now we can take the kickstarter off. If you have difficulty getting the kickstarter off, you can split this open a little bit with a flat screwdriver, that little slot right there. Make sure the splines are in good shape. And next we could just carefully tap the, the, the shaft out of the and I had my hand underneath it just to catch it as it dropped out. So you can see this is still pretty clean. The kickstart spring, there's no reason that any issues with that. Um, the one thing I was going to do is these things are in really good shape. I suspect now that I've seen that this motor's been apart at some point based on the green um, grease that's in there. That was never, we'll go ahead and this is something I like to do. If they're still in good shape, I'll just flip them around. But typically if they're not in good shape and dented pretty heavily, I would just replace them. So, And everything's pretty clean in here, no problems there. There's an O-ring in here that we're going to go ahead and remove. So see that O-ring right, right through the spot, you use that little screwdriver and pry that right out. In the gasket kit is a brand new O-ring, grease that all up and it's kind of a little bit of a trick but you just kind of slide it in there and you may need to use your finger and push it in from the other way and you just make sure it's back in the groove. And that's pretty much how you put this. That's what seals the um, kickstart kick shaft. So that's all in there. Drop that in. And go ahead and drop that little pin right in there. So you take, take a channel locks that grip on the spring pretty, pretty well and just kind of keep tension on the spring, downward tension and just go ahead and get that engaged. And that's all it takes, put that spring back together. Uh, it is possible to do it by hand. Uh, it takes quite a, quite a grip where you're right over it with a rag so you don't get your hand pinched. Uh, but it is definitely possible if you needed to. So gasket surface is all pretty clean all the way around. Now it's time to stuff the crank. So the wood of key is gonna stay in place. Sometimes it wants to come out it's going to make the job a little easier if the water key does come out. But if it's in there, you can leave it alone. Gloves blowing out. Uh, we're going to go ahead and grease the seal lip all the way around. 
and take a little grease and go on to the seal lip and bearing in here as well. And take the clutch nut off and carefully stuff the crank. So the last thing you want to do is tap this in. It will throw the crank out of true. I don't have any reason to believe that this crank is needs to be trued or anything, but uh, sometimes we'll start, you know, kind of carefully rest the piston. And then next from the other side, we're going to use the clutch as the puller and I'll show how that, how that's accomplished. So the way you can use the clutch to pull the crankshaft back into place is you don't want to put this, the oil pump drive gear back in just yet. Uh, we're going to lubricate these threads here so you don't damage them. And while we're holding the crankshaft to keep it from dropping through, I'm going to carefully thread this clutch on. So you got to sight down there and get the water piece. It still has that in place. And next, with the oil on the threads of the crankshaft, go ahead and start to thread the, um, the clutch nut on. Now I'm going to carefully use the impact to bottom out the clutch. So and I'm watching it. So go ahead and now pull the clutch back off with the flat bladed screwdrivers, just like you did in the first step. So that pulled the majority of the clutch or the crankshaft into the bearing. So without the, the special tool, that's one way to do that safely without damaging the, um, the clutch. Now we'll take this, uh, the oil pump drive gear. There's a side that has a larger uh, bevel to it and we're gonna, that's gonna go in, inside. So it goes like that and go ahead and make sure it threads with the uh, um, meshes with that gear there. And go ahead and repeat. We'll just go ahead and line up the, the, the clutch. And sometimes it takes a little bit. Got to hold the gear and now it's back on. Again, I'm not going to put the, uh, the star washer back on, but I'll put the nut back on there and pull the clutch the rest of the way on. So. So support the piston so it's not spinning. So I saw it stop, stop right there and that's, and that's as far as it needs to go. So now the, the crankshaft has been pulled right into the bearing and the seal. And no problems there. Everything rotates really freely. Feels good. And go ahead and put the new lock washer in place. And you can see it's got the little tang that that aligns with uh, the um, the clutch. And sometimes they're a little stubborn. You can just take a screwdriver. You don't need necessarily a hammer, but you can give it a couple taps to get it into the, or even use a 14 millimeter socket. That works pretty good to get it in there. So uh, put the nut back on. And the recommended way to do this is you could put a tool that locks this and holds the clutch. Could use a flat bladed screwdriver very carefully and tighten that nut to about 30 foot pounds. Um, but as what I found, is your, if you're careful with the impact, you could usually get away with, since it does have the ability, you know, the tab that locks it. You know, I'm not really a fan of using an impact to tighten things to the final torque, but I'm watching the socket. And now I could see if it's lined up with any of the, um, the tangs. And I think we are. Yeah, we're pretty good right there. So I think it's lined up with that one down there. And now you could take, you know, usually I don't want to use a hammer. You could just use something like a larger diagonal plier just to get that 
that tang. Use a little chisel or a flat blade, blade screwdriver and get that thing. Make sure that's all the way set into the, the groove right here. So. so that's all set pretty good right there. No problems there. Put this back in place. And to get that upper part on the larger hole, you just go ahead and pry that little um, clip down and give it a couple of rotates. And it should be just fine right there. It's a little bit oil dripping out of the clutch, no big deal there. And we'll go ahead and put the clutch cover on. Don't need to hook up the cable. We'll come back to that at a later time. No issues there. So get all, all the holes lined up and that's the quick and dirty way to get in and out of the clutch and get the crankshaft pulled in into place. So. so I went ahead and reinstalled the three clutch cover bolts. I just did them in a crisscross fashion so it carefully tightens that cover back on. I know the clutch arm is all in good place. I could feel that this, this feels fine. Um, I'll connect up the clutch cable later, Don't, won't worry about that right now, and I reinstalled the shock nut since we no longer need to access that, that cover up there. So next I'll pop the shifting cross in there and take the brand new one. Even though the other one's in great condition, I'm just going to start with a brand new shift, shifting cross. And one thing you want to check before you go to town is make sure this threads into the cross. Sometimes so what I'll do is I'll I'll do a test, you know, make sure it threads all the way on, no problems, you know, without any issues, just make sure it's, because otherwise if you cross that in there, you're going to ruin the shaft or even worse, break that off. It's kind of soft and tend to want to break off. A little bit of friction there and that's okay. So we're good on the shifting cross, the brand new shifting cross. And you want to take it in and go ahead and see how this flat surface right here, we're gonna have the, road, the, the round spots on there and we'll go ahead and rotate it right into, into position. Um, the later ones, the EFL ones, sometimes you gotta try a different notch. There is a little hole on the, the later gearboxes, not this style, but they have a little hole that will line up. Sometimes they're just a little stubborn to get rotated into place. So you may need to you know, use something to kind of press it. You know, get it, get it rotated around. And if they're really stubborn, sometimes I'll file the shifting cross, some of the sharp edges on the shifting cross. Generally the original Piaggio ones have the least, least problems uh, reinstalling, but sometimes there's a little friction because they're just brand new and sharp. And I'm just going to get it rotated where it's all squares. Once it squares up, you can see it's now nice and loose and you want to make sure it slides freely back and forth. I'm going to push it all the way back to the end. And next, since we're not going to be able to swage the end of this shaft easy, Make sure this washer is here. This washer goes with that little bevel against the, um, the right side of the scooter. So we'll put a little Loctite on there. This, the blue Loctite is perfectly fine. You don't need to go crazy with the red stuff. That's difficult to get off. Um, go ahead and carefully thread this in. And you can tell it's gonna thread no problem. So, so again, it's the tight this one is going to be counterclockwise uh, maybe a little easier if the wheels on but not needed because we'll just lock up this so still, still moves freely make sure that's not an issue there you can carefully put a screwdriver through there this that this this whole part's hard and it's not gonna have any problems so so go ahead and just give it a good snug with the loctite no problems make sure this slides in and out no issues. Uh, you could put a small amount of oil. This is the same oil we put on the clutch. 
and just go ahead and key the gears and you can watch the directions I put them. See how that's got kind of that larger lip that's gonna face me. You engage them with this um, Christmas tree up there as I like to call it. Uh, this one, you can see there's a, a thicker gap on this side. That's gonna be a neutral in between the second and then third gear right here. So, and the last gear just goes like this. And they're only shimmed on the one side on these older gearboxes. A little bit, little bit more work on the newer gearboxes, but they tend to hold the um, hold the gear a little bit better just because it was an improvement on later ones. But these ones work fine. Uh, with this wood, this this split ring, you make sure the sharp edge is going to face out. And we'll go ahead and get a circlip pliers here and this thing's under a tremendous amount of tension so you know make sure you don't get your fingers caught in anything but see how it's almost all the way there you just give it a couple little taps and it will usually drop right into place so no, no issues there make sure it's in the groove all the way around um, typically I'd check this but with such low mileage the free you could put two fuel gauges you can watch my my more in-depth video on rebuilding these motors, but not necessary on this, this motor here. So, uh, last part that goes in here is the kickstart. Believe it or not, if you, if you could accidentally forget to put this in, you go to realize you close up the case and you can't kickstart the bike. So, that would be a problem. So, with the kickstart spring, I tend to want to stretch them out a little bit. Give it a little stretch so it looks like it's about 25, 30 millimeters long, an inch or so. And the way to hold this in place, the best way is just put a layer of grease on the edge of, of this thing or in this well here. So go ahead and do that. And the thing's just gonna hold in place just fine. A couple other things to put grease on is on these, these axle shafts all around this um, fly side bearing and then on this little guy. And the, the bearings are already lubricated. This is out of a motor since we're reusing the Bearings, no issues there. Want to have your kickstart handy. It's not attached yet, but that's no problem. Uh, cleaned up the gasket surface. Everything looks good. Gears in place. Uh, the piston. You got to be careful for that because it's going to want to flop around as we assemble it. So these are nice quality treated gaskets. No need to really coat them. You just want to have clean uh, mating surfaces. And as you can see, I have most of the studs are pulled out. I left these two studs in place, no, no problem there, but you could go either, either way. Um, let's make sure it's kind of there in place. Uh, this little pin is gonna engage in the other case, make sure it's not gonna pinch the gasket because if the gasket gets off to the side. And next, we'll make sure everything's all greased up. All these shafts looked all greased up. Um, the, the seal lip on the flywheel side just a small amount of grease on everything. You want to have the kickstart installed. I don't have the bolt through it, but no, no big deal. And you just sight this, and I'm just looking for the fixed, um, the four fixed um, studs. No, no big deal there. So the next next part is we're going to want to close this up. So you can see it kind of wants to rock around. I'm going to kick the kickstarter down and give it a couple wiggles. Make sure this gasket, the pin's going in, no problem there. Give this a wiggle. And at this point, with the kickstart a little bit down, you could just, you know, give it little taps all around and it should close right up with, without any issue. Even the, the, the tone of the motor changes when it's closed up. So now we'll just, kind of double check. Kickstart is working. It's turned the piston over very carefully. Get the kickstart out of the way. It makes it a little bit easier. Uh, put all the studs back in. These are the short studs. And they do have a flat, so the flat goes against the case. This long stud here is one that goes all the way through the swing arm, and that's what that little, um, the, the cable, the thing that uh, holds the cable clamps onto. Make sure look around, make sure nothing's pinched. The last thing you want is a cable pinched in between your gasket surface. 
or the gas gets folded and you, you're just wondering why is it leaking, you know. Sometimes these old motors will leak anyways, but if it's leaking a lot, you know, there, there might be a problem, so. Um, this one goes that direction. And I have the last one, just pop it through this, this way. And the shock's in the way a little bit, but it will. And we're getting close, so. Next, we'll take all our flat washers and just go ahead and place them on all these, um, the studs. They're all seven millimeter flat washers. One more uh, stud up there I need to find. Now the split washers on top of the flat washers. Uh, these are still in good shape. Oftentimes I will replace these. So just go around, get them all on. Uh, that one's going to get the, the cable clamp, so don't need to worry about that. So next I'll start getting the nuts in place. And I typically like to start on the, the fixed studs here. And typically when you remove a nut, you'll see one area that's, you know, been abraded against the, um, the split washer. You typically want to put that on the same, um, same order as you did before. It's not the end of the world if you have them the other way, but that's just, if you're reusing the nuts, that's typically how you do it. And a lot of times I can even, even through the glove, I can feel that there's a little sharp burr on the one side of the, the nut, and that's the side that's going to go against the um, against the washer. So I got the 11 millimeter socket. You gotta be careful with one of these because you can't over tighten it. But the whole idea of this just, uh, you know, just to get everything kind of bottom in. I'm not doing the final torquing with this. And, and I'm just kind of going between. And I can get this one on that didn't fail to start earlier. So it's a little easier without the kick starting away. So this one. That one's a little more difficult. I just finish it with uh, the combination wrench. And one other thing I'd like to take off just so it's a reminder to myself, there's no gearbox oil in there. So I'll go ahead and leave the drain bolt out or the fill bolt that is. All right, now we can go back with a hand wrench because I got a lot more control. Uh, about 11 foot pounds if you're gonna torque them with a torque wrench. And I'm just kind of grabbing this longer wrench, kind of midpoint, and that's about where you want the torque. Uh, one thing you'll notice on near the piston, there's going to be uh, some of the gaskets revealed. You just want to take a knife in there just, and just go ahead and shave that. And you could pick the little last little piece right out do the, the same with the bottom. You don't want to leave those little folds. It will cause a real small air leak. Could cause some problems. So make sure you cut those out of the way. Uh, before I get the wheel on, I can get this, this axle. See how I'm turning the, the axle right there to get that out. Now I can put the selector box on. You'll need the... Um, the gasket here, the, surf, the gasket surfaces are all clean on the case there, so no problems there. And we'll go ahead and take this guy. We know that the adjustment's good. It's the perfect time to make any adjustments to this box. Feels pretty good. Go ahead and lubricate this whole mechanism. The cables. They typically go underneath these little, little clips there. So I'm going to turn it past the fourth gear. Don't worry about that popping out. And I'm going to engage that tooth 
that thing right in there. And now I can start to, um, to get these studs lined up. And go ahead and pull it towards neutral. And there we go. Now we're back in neutral. Get the pair of washers and it looks like they had nylock nuts on here that works works better than the original um, to split split washers with the, the standard nuts on there that they normally do. Oops. Hands are getting a little on the greasy side. And just like uh, assembling the cases, just kind of go between the two. And again, if you want to torque it with a torque wrench, 11 foot pounds. I uh, didn't see any reason really to adjust the cables. They seem pretty good. Uh, go ahead and pop that back into the clip and get the Kickstarter back on. Slide that on and put the bolt through. Flat washer and then the split washer on the bottom. And the single eight millimeter nut. You need a 13 millimeter wrench to tighten that up. And you wanna make sure this is pretty snug. About 16, 17 foot pounds. Last thing, if you have this loose, it may slip. So, and we know that's all gonna work. Um, I'm gonna come back to the carburetor and the stator plate, so I'm gonna leave all this stuff off. The last thing I'm gonna put together is get the cylinder back in place. So I have the piston in there. The ring grooves are lined up with the pegs. I haven't moved any of that kind of stuff. Still in really good shape. So this surface is quite clean. We're gonna go ahead and put a replacement uh, aluminum gasket for the base, if you want to, you could put a small amount of grease under there just to kind of keep it in place so it doesn't move around as you're uh, putting it back on. It's important the ring lands are in there. The cylinders just got a real thin film of oil. You can use any type of oil just to put a small film. There's no sense in honing this or checking the ring and gap. It just looks so good considering the miles, so I'm not, not concerned with it. Uh, no, no issues with the top end, that's good compression. And now I'm gonna look, look at the cylinder and you gotta squeeze the rings sometimes just a little bit to get them in. And you shouldn't have to fight them, otherwise you're gonna end up breaking the, the rings. Next, it's really important to make sure these holes line up. If you have the uh, piston a little bit twisted, it may end up um, catching with uh, the rings may catch one of the ports. So it turns over very nice right now. No problems there. Making a little squeaks, but no problem. So uh, now I can put the studs back in. The nice thing is I left all the, the double nuts on all these. So it makes the job a lot easier to And starting them by hand here. So pretty much the P200 studs, they're not gonna overshoot unless you really, really tighten them. You know, they'll, right when they start getting snug, in the case, that's as far as you want to go. So about right there. And you don't need to crank them down. You could actually damage 
can run into the oil pump gear. That would be bad, you know, if you over torque them into the case. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, just right where it gets snug and no problems there. So uh, once you get those in, you know, put your wrench on there, just hold it. And that's all you need to do to, to break the, the nuts free, so. And pretty much repeat with the other two uh, front studs. And when they're all correct, they'll, all the studs will um, exit the, the top of the deck of the, the cylinder about the same amount. So, so you kind of look at them, they all look like they're about the same amount. That's good enough. So the cylinder, didn't, the cylinder head didn't have much leakage. They do not run a head gasket on these. I don't think there's any issue with this one. I'm just gonna reassemble the head. You know, in my more in-depth uh, rebuild videos, I show how you could surface these with um, sandpaper and uh, e either a plate of glass or micro flat. And so wipe the surface, make sure it's perfectly clean. You can use a little bit of solvent. Same with this. Looks really clean in there. And the head just pretty much goes like, like such. Yeah, sometimes you gotta kind of push it back past the cables. And I'll put all the flat washers on. All four of them. Next to split washers, they're still in decent shape. These still have a little bit of split. I don't know how critical they are, but put them back. That's the way they've always run these. So. And now we'll start with the brand new uh, eight millimeter nuts. Again, just like when I was removing them, I'll just start them by threading them on with a extension. All right, so we'll get them all pretty much started and bottom all, them all out before we start using the wrench. Some of these just need a little bit of And in a crisscross pat pattern, you tor torque these to about 16 foot pounds. And with this little wrench here, this, if I do it pretty tight with this little wrench, that's about 16 foot pounds. So I'm just going back and forth. And there we go. So we'll give them all, it's more important that they're all even than with the the absolute torque is so. And they were all torqued pretty evenly. Now we could put the spacer back on, on that rearmost um, upper stud. And the last two things we're gonna do in this video, I'm gonna get the uh, muffler back on and the rear tire. Uh, no issues with the brakes, they look really clean. There's no oil contamination. At this point I could see that the, the bike cranks over without issues. There's nothing binding or it feels perfectly fine. I don't suspect any issues. No, no spark plug in here at this point. But we'll move on to the other side and uh, get that muffler back on. So we put the bolt in. Uh, I'm not gonna tie it at this point. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the other side and tap the header back in place onto the spigot. So carefully tap the header back in place. You don't wanna hit the header so hard that you distort it. And just like when you removed it, you can use a chisel, the, the hit against on the weld. And it kind of changed tone, kind of indicating that it's at the end. We'll come back and tighten that once we get the muffler bolt through. So now the muffler bolt should tighten right up against the, um, in, uh, into that captive nut. 
take a 17 millimeter wrench and this should be pretty tight. Something like about 30 foot pounds. Don't want the muffler bolt coming out. If it comes out, it ends up rubbing on the rear tire and, and making a mess of your rear tire. It could potentially pop the tire. So. so everything's very clean inside. There's no grease contamination on these original brake shoes. So I'm not worried about the brake shoes or the gaskets behind. There's some dust cover gaskets that are included with the gasket. Not really necessary to change those out because they do not hold oil back just to keep moisture and, and oil out of the, um, the brake hub. So go ahead and put that on. There's grease on the lip of the seal. Go ahead and put the thick washer on. And now we could drop down the scooter and torque the rear axle nut, put the cotter pan in. So we're gonna go ahead and torque this to around 60 to 80 foot pounds. And the tire's now on the ground, so it sh you should be able to torque this no problem. Just see what we can get. So I'm gonna go to about 61 right there. And here's the thing, you gotta get one of these uh, notches to line up. And at 60 foot pounds, I'm getting this one to line up. That's not too bad. So go ahead and put the cotter pin through. You don't really want to go more than 80. If you over torque that, you could potentially uh, crack the um, crack the axle on these smaller axles. The later later scooters, they went to a different, a larger nut and a larger threads, and you could torque those ones to the full 80 and they use a better design for um, locking the nut in place. So get a, the cotter pin in there. You can fold that over. Not much room in these um, cotter pins. You know, watch out cutting these cotter pins. And then this side, you can just cut the little tail. And now that that's uh, torqued and tight, you could and put the little hubcap back on. So, so the last thing I'm gonna do on the video, I did say the tire, I'm gonna put oil in the crankcase. The reason for that is wanna see, when I come back to this, this scooter in another week, I'm gonna make sure there's no leaks coming from the engine case, you know, with the gearbox oil. So everything's wiped up. I put a new uh, gasket. One thing to keep in mind, if it's a fiber gasket, you don't, do not tighten these too tight, the, um, the drain bolts. Then how you fill the gearbox oil, I typically like a squeeze bottle like this. Um, I would wanna have it all the way full with um, something like modal trans oil. So I'd fill up some type of squeeze bottle. You can use a ketchup bottle or one of the large syringes we sell. Part number on this is oil trans. It's a modal trans oil. It works great with the vintage Vespas. So I fill up my bottle. I've been using this squeeze bottle for since 2003, and it hasn't broken, it's been remarkable. I probably, I can't even think of how much gear oil is. And it's like, and you just squeeze it right in, so. And I'll just double check. You want it right where it starts running out. That's too much oil right there. I'll let some of it run out for a second. And you can leave it to a point where it's Dribble out a little bit, and that's no no problem there. Yeah, you know, just right to where it's a stream. So now that's that's about the right level. So it's enough to um, keep everything in oil that needs to be oiled, but you don't want to have it severely overfilled. And it's not much oil. It's like about 200 to 250 cc's of oil. Now I'll go ahead and tighten this. I'm gonna leave. Electrical, I'm gonna cover up the intake. I'm not gonna put the flywheel back on because I'm gonna save that for another video. So the next videos I'm gonna have is overhauling the fuel system, which is clean the carburetor and the fuel tank, put new lines in here. And then there's also gonna be an electrical video where I uh, repair the wiring on the stator plate, probably put a brand new CDI and repair the green wire that goes through the whole entire frame. So that's pretty much my simplified quick rebuild 
something I would do on a scooter that was, um, has very low miles. I know it doesn't need bearings or any gears or a piston cylinder, um, something like this 3,000 mile bike. Pretty straightforward, just going in there, replacing the seals and gaskets. Uh, as you can see, it's a pretty easy job. Only a few specialty tools are needed. We have those all available on scooterwest.com along with uh, discounted kits of the seals. So if you buy all the set of seals and gaskets, usually you can find those uh, discounted. In the description, I'll have the part numbers of the parts and tools that we do sell um, in the description of the video for a P200, you know, specifically this 1978 P200. Keep in mind, they've made some changes on these motors over the years, or if you have a Stella, there's, uh, which is an LML, uh, some minor differences in there. Um, I hope you found that all useful, a little quicker than pulling the whole entire motor out and doing a full rebuild. Ideal if all you got to get in there, change the shifting cross or replace seals because you got an air leak, put a new crankshaft in, something like that, and you know the rest of the motor's in good shape. This is Robot from Vespa Motorsport and ScooterWest.com. I hope you found that uh, pretty interesting, whether you're just watching the video and you're into modern Vespas or, or if you're a seasoned uh, vintage uh, Vespa specialist, I hope you found some of my tips useful or if you have better tips out there, feel free to comment. I don't have time to comment on the uh, videos. Pretty busy uh, working here at Vespa Motorsport and Scooter West, keeping, keeping things rolling here in our service department. Uh, if you're new to the channel, stumble across this for the first time, subscribe to our channel, uh, browse through all our videos, hit the little bell to get notified on new videos. I'm always making new videos, been making them for years. Um, you'll probably stumble across some other videos, a how-to video, or some cool accessories you sell that might help you out. Until next time, Robot here.